Hi, this is Mrs. McConnell, and this is the first of many podcasts that I'm going to be recording for this course. Now, since I'm entering the course midstream, let me say from the beginning that I realize you have already covered some of this material. I will try to approach it from some different angles, and I promise that soon we'll be entering new territory. In the first unit, you encountered the basic concepts of consumer demand and producer supply. In this unit, we're going to dig deeper into the components of supply and demand. Our goal is to figure out how firms know what to produce and how firms know how much to produce. The short answer is that they produce the products and quantities that will generate the greatest total re total profit for them. But that, in turn, requires firms to figure out first what consumers want and what drives their buying choices. That part's demand. Then firms need to figure out how much they should produce. The answer to this question, or a supply depends pretty much entirely on the cost of production. So let's start out with consumer demand and this basic question, why do I and a lot of other people eat too much at Chakarama? So I really like dark meat fried chicken, thighs and drumsticks. What is different about reaching for a couple more drumsticks at Chakarama and ordering a couple more drumsticks at Kentucky Fried Chicken? If you answer that you don't have to pay the, for the drumsticks at Chakarama, you are partly right. But of course, you did pay for them. Dinner at Chakarama, the last I checked, is not free. What you don't face at Chakarama is any marginal cost for continuing to munch. An additional unit of chicken does not add to the price of your meal. At KFC, it does. So at KFC, I ask myself, is the pleasure I would get from two more pieces of chicken equal to the pleasure I'd get from something else I would buy for $4.99? And by the way, that's probably the meal price. But for our purposes, we'll say that's chicken. In other words, I evaluate the opportunity cost of buying another helping of chicken. Another way of asking the same question using still more economic vocabulary is, does the marginal utility of the chicken, the additional happiness I get from it, equal its marginal cost or the additional price I must pay for the chicken? So, what do I mean by the term utility? Well, economists use the word to describe anything you value uh, and are therefore willing to give up other resources to acquire. It's really open-ended. They don't try to attempt to define what value is. It just says it's what you have. So, for, And it's very individual. So Brussels sprouts roasted with olive oil and some nice balsamic vinegar uh, have lots of utility for me. They actually have negative utility for my husband. In other words, he would happily give up some resources in order not to eat Brussels sprouts. So let's take a product that almost all of us like, ice cream. So that first ice cream cone makes me very happy. It gives me great utility, four utils of utility, according to this chart. And yes, believe it or not, economists actually use the word utils. Since I went from having no ice cream and no utils to one ice cream and four utils, my marginal utility and total utility are the same. Uh, they're four. The increase, the marginal utility, which is the most important measure, is four. So I like ice cream. The second ice cream cone still makes me happy, but not quite as ecstatic as the first cone. It gives me an additional two utils of pleasure. Note that my total utility is still increasing. I'm up to six utils. But my marginal utility, the amount of utility I get from an additional ice cream cone, from that second ice cream cone, is declining. And that is what economists call the law of declining marginal utility. The first gulp of a big gulp is always better than the second gulp, and so on. Okay, the third ice cream cone, on the other hand, does not increase my total utility. Why did I order it anyway, since it gives me no marginal utility? Well, turns out somebody bet that I couldn't eat just one more, and so... On to the fourth ice cream cone, and it does not settle well. Now, my total utility actually goes down from six to four, which means that marginal utility is not just declining now, it has actually turned negative. Just remember, marginal utility, at least according to economic theory, I'm going to present an expert viewpoint challenging this in your quiz, but according to economists, marginal utility always declines. Now marginal utility is not only declining, it has turned negative. Now if I were a sensible economic actor bent on maximizing utility, I'd stop now. But let's put one more point on our chart. Okay, you get the picture. 
And speaking of pictures, I understand that some of you are less than enthusiastic about graphs. Graphs actually, once you get over your, ah, it's a graph, reaction, make economics easier. Just like when I was in first grade, it was easier to read one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, when it was accompanied by pictures of one fish and a two fish and a red fish and a blue fish. Notice what a clear and immediate picture the graph gives you of what I just described in a lot of words. Total utility rises until marginal utility turns negative and then falls. Marginal utility falls from the beginning. So it's time to break for some quick problem solving. Uh, at the end of this lecture, you're going to have some time to work with a partner on practice problems or, if you're watching this at home, to do the practice problems on your own. The practice quiz doesn't count, and you'll be able to see the correct answer and explanation as soon as you submit your quiz. Then, at the end of the class, perhaps sometimes the beginning of the next class, you're going to take a quiz. You will get those results the next class period, so you'll be able to learn from that quiz. At any rate, here's one of the two kinds of problems you'll encounter. We don't know what good we're talking about in this case, but we do know that consuming that first unit, I like to call it the first bite, gives this consumer 20 utils. So what is the marginal utility of the first bite? It's 20, right? since we've gone from 0 to 20 utils. If the marginal utility of the second byte is 10, what is the total utility after you've taken two bytes? So if you add the 10 bytes, uh, the marginal utility to the 20 utils you already have, you have a total utility of 30. Note the total utility is still going up, even though marginal utility is going down. So what's the marginal utility of the third byte? If the marginal, if the utility has gone from 30 to 37, marginal utility is the difference between those. It has to be 7. And finally, what is your total utility after byte 4? If marginal utility is 2, it must be 9. Notice that marginal utility in this uh, chart is not negative yet. We haven't reached the barf point. So total utility is still going up. So, how does the law of declining marginal utility affect the way that anybody runs a business? This chart may offer a clue. What you see is the price of McDonald's French fries, at least as listed on one of the websites. So, how is McDonald's applying the law of declining marginal utility, and how is it making money from this? Well, if you divide the price by ounce, you see that the price per ounce goes from approximately 50 cents to 40 cents to 30 cents as you move from small to medium to large. In other words, McDonald's is obeying the law of declining marginal utility. To make people willing and able to buy more of something, everything else being equal or ceteris paribus, they're going to have to lower the price. So, and that, by the way, is also the law of demand. So, how does this help them make money? Well, as long as the cost of producing an extra ounce of fries is less than what McDonald's charges you for buying an extra ounce of fries, in other words, if McDonald's marginal cost is less than the marginal revenue or additional money that they bring in, notice, by the way, that most economics terms become quite simple if you just remember what marginal means. At any rate, if they do this, they're still adding to their profits and to our waistlines. Since one of my objectives for this course is to try to apply economic concepts to real life, um, let me pause and make a note that it's important to realize that declining marginal utility refers to a very short time period. Six ice cream cones eaten in 20 minutes or even an hour may make me sick. But does eating ice cream today make me less likely to want an ice cream cone tomorrow? In other words, does the law of diminishing marginal utility persist after a good night's sleep? Well, no. And in fact, there are both psychological and biological reasons to believe that repeated exposure to some goods builds up our craving over time and actually shifts our personal demand curve to the right, makes us willing and able to purchase more um, you know, at the same price. So we know that's true of addictive drugs. It's probably true of sugar. In other words, exposure may increase the marginal utility of goods and what consumers will pay for them. 
So I couldn't resist posting this article from The Economist, although it's not really completely about marginal utility as we look at it. So the question is, what happens when students are exposed to the work of John Everett Millay, which they cite as an example of good art, although he's not personally one of my favorites, and Thomas Kincaid, upper uh, lower right, which The Economist and I both agree is bad art. Sorry if you're a Kincaid fan. But... <clears throat> Does exposure to that bad art increase its marginal utility, or is, does the law of declining marginal utility kick in? It's not actually really quite a correct uh, use of the law of declining marginal utility, but it's fun, and you can get some extra credit from reading it. At any rate, on to another element of utility. So far, we have looked at utility in terms of a single consumption good, fried chicken or ice cream cones or McDonald's french fries. But real-life consumers are trying to maximize their utility over a whole range of goods, right? Given that we don't have unlimited resources, remember that this notion of scarcity and kind of open-ended desires lies at the heart of market economics. How do we choose what we buy? Well, the answer an economist gives is that we try to get the most utils for the buck, or to put it a little more technically, we try to maximize our marginal utility per dollar. That's why we eat too much at Chekarama. There's no marginal cost to another helping. So, as the, econ the economists would say, as long as we are still getting marginal utility, however small, we need to keep eating. And let me anticipate a problem. You may be thinking, I don't eat that much at Chekarama. That doesn't contradict it. It just says that your utility schedule, what you want, is different than perhaps the person who uh, is a 15-year-old boy who never gains weight or someone who's given up altogether. Uh, utility, remember, is completely self-referential. It's what you value. And if you value looking good in your bathing suit uh, more than you value an additional uh, fried chicken drumstick, then you're making a decision that maximizes your utility at any rate. Let's move away from fried chicken to something more fun. Let's assume that I just sold my new killer app to one of my Palo Alto neighbors, and I've now got $500,000 in the bank. This Lamborghini would give me 3,000 utils of pure bliss. But I'd really also like to get an iPhone 6. It would give me three measly utils of pleasure, but I'd like one. So which one should I buy first? Remember. The way I've set this up, a little unrealistically, I can afford either one. But I want to purchase the product that maximizes my marginal utility per dollar. That's the product I should purchase next in the market basket of goods available to me out there in the world. For now, by the way, let's assume that this will be my first Lamborghini or my first iPhone 6. So total and marginal utility are the same. <clears throat> what this tells us is... I should get the iPhone first. I get more utils for my money. And chances are there are a lot of other uh, items out there which offer a better util for dollar trade-off, which is why, sigh, I probably will not end up buying the Lamborghini. <clears throat> so I was debating between my first Lamborghini and my first iPhone, right? But the calculation might have been very different if I'd been looking at my second Lamborghini or iPhone 6. Since then, the law of declining marginal utility would kick in. So let's look at how we would allocate our resources among three goods with the following, obviously, a completely arbitrary utility schedule. We have good A, which costs $1, good B, which costs $2, good C, which costs $3. Well, the first line is easy, since total utility and marginal utility are the same for the first bite, right? To get the marginal utility per dollar, you just divide that marginal utility by the price. And note that I picked numbers that were pretty easy to do. For the second time, for the second line, excuse me, how do we figure out marginal utility? A uh, good C's total utility goes up 36 from 60 to 96. That means it has a marginal utility of 36 since good C costs $3. That's marginal utility per dollar of 12. Basically, it's a series of arithmetic exercises, and of course, you can use your calculator. So here's the rest of the chart. Remember, marginal utility is how much total utility goes up Marginal utility per dollar is marginal utility divided by price. But now we add in your budget. Suppose you have $26 to spend. 
What do you buy? Remember that you always buy next the good that maximizes your marginal utility per dollar. There's back to why uh, I'm more likely to eat a drumstick at Chakarama than to go up to the counter and buy another one at KFC. So let's start buying goods in order, starting with the highest marginal utility per dollar. Remember that you have to keep track of how much money you have to spend and how much you've already spent. So here are the first four items that you would buy because they have the highest marginal utility per dollar. And here are the next four items that you would buy. Uh, one more group of four, uh, excuse me, one more, and you have just $2 left. And the final bite of good uh, B cleans you out. So that's enough for now. You get to try this in your teams. The first two to get the right answer get a, well, not so giant cookie. And then you will take your quiz.